I am Oh, okay. How well your measurements approximate true, right? That can be hard. It's fun, right? So in this case, we have 50% sure, but we missed the point. So we're inaccurate. In this case, we have poor precision. But actually, if you take the average, it's fairly accurate. In this case, yeah, it's poor precision. Correct. This is why we use the precision. How does it work? How do we do chemical analysis? We think of uh, chemical measurements here. So all these things and we're not, uh, we're actually using characteristic x rays So a characteristic x ray forms. Uh, we have a, again, it's a spectrum. So we shoot the sample of electrons in the It has electrons of its own. Uh, so an electron meets another electron. What happens? It gets Okay. We can actually knock these electrons away from those atoms. And in doing so, you create an atom that's, that's unstable. And so, to make that stable again, another electron, this nearest available electron, will immediately fill that shell. Usually, the nearest, ele uh, nearest electron will be from an outer shell. If you knock out an inner electron, another electron will come down and fill it. And so, in doing so, you went from a high energy state, unstable, to a low energy since you had to preserve energy in the system, and I don't understand this myself, you, you create a photon. A photon just appears out of thin air, right? To preserve that energy, it takes up this energy. And so we're creating a uh, characteristic photon or a characteristic X ray from this electron transition. And it turns out that different atoms have different energies of photons that they produce. And there's this guy, Mosley, that that the, the relationship between the atomic number and the energy yeah. of the X-ray so we're looking at K-shell and K-shell transitions the energy of those transitions Jadi presensi ya. Oh yang S1 ya. Yang S1. Yang S1. Ya om presensi ni tu. S2. Presensinya di Mas Rossi dulu. Sampai mau terkuri dulu. Okey. Masih kuat kan? Iya. Tak perlu ini buat. Okay. 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 Okay.
destroying the electron now. As the electron slows down, it moves there and makes it uh, and, But since these interactions are less predictable, we need less to the electrons. So our goal here in doing chemical analysis using X rays is to measure these characteristic X ray lines and subtract them out of this X ray continuum. Right? So we need to measure on the peak, and then we need to measure the background. So how do we do that? How do we measure the stack of X-rays? Well, we use the wave theory of light. Light's a wave. It's also a wave. And so we can use bright reflections. We use uh, crystals. So crystals have parallel planes where you can set up constructive scattering using bright wavelength of the photon coming in. So if you adjust the angle of this crystal, you can constructively reflect a specific wavelength out. Right? So the other wavelengths won't be constructively reflected. So you can tilt this crystal and position it to filter out to exactly the X-ray that you want to so only construct the X-ray. This is uh, Bragg, William Bragg won the Nobel Prize for this in 1912 using a spectrometer that is dead. So his dad built the spectrometer, and what I found remarkable about this spectrometer is the way it's set up. It has an x-ray slit, and the x-rays come out of the movable crystal, and a gas ionization chamber that acts as a detector. It turns out that we're still using the identical thing more than 100 years later. Uh, in this case, we have our electron beam inside our microscope. It's producing an x-ray that goes through a slit, moves to a positionable crystal, and a positionable gas detector. So it's, it's, it's the same hardware for 100 years, right? Uh, and this is our probe, so uh, this is an NTU. This is the electron microscope. You can see it's got these five crystal spectrometers around it, so it can measure five wavelengths at once. So it's set up for doing chemical analysis. Other than that, it's just an electron microscope. So we can do both quantitative analysis, as I say, and we can also do chemical imaging. So we can do maps. So Elements. This is examples. Have you guys know what a zenolith is? It's a, it's a piece of the Earth's mantle that deep with it's brought up by a volcano. So here we've done some chemical mapping. We can map calcium in here, which is a corresponds to a mineral called clinocuricine, which can help us classify this rock based on the mineral composition. So here's a calcium map of the iron. The next guy, what John These are just Here's an optical fiber, so it's not just in geology, it's in material science a lot of things. This is an optical fiber, it's about half a millimeter across. There's this core region. <coughs> this one's doped with uh, ytterbium, aluminum, phosphorus. We can do maps of those elements, and then we can do a series of chemical analysis. You see these are spaced one micron apart along a traverse. We get those measurements, we can see, okay, it's got one weight percent ytterbium, one and a half weight percent phosphorus. Chemical measurements at small spatial scales using characteristic x rays. Back to a gumbo game. So, within these, uh, these two eruptions that we looked at, we found these things called monocrysts, which just means a whole bunch of crystals stuck together. Right? And uh, these crystals had zones at the margin. You can see uh, in this electron, as you see, it's a different color here and here. We think that. That, that this must have formed immediately prior to eruption. It's going to tell us something about when that magma erupted. Uh, so, in particular, it can give us a, yeah, well, it gives a few things, but to start with, it can give us the temperature in which these things form. Um, and so that's another method that we use is mineral thermometry. I don't know how familiar you guys are with minerals. Uh, Alright, so here's one example. This is olivine, a common mineral, uh, in Earth's mantle. It's a solid solution series between a magnesium and an iron end number. And the crystallization temperature of these different components of the, of the olivine will depend on its composition. So the higher temp magnesium end number is the higher temperature end number, and the iron end number is the lower temperature end number. And so when we look at a volcanic uh, and we see that a crystal zone, which it commonly is, we have names for this zone. So normal zoning, 
would be for any mineral, not just aluminum, would be the higher temperature core and the lower temperature rim. Because the crystals grow from quarter rim, and you would expect that magmas and lavas will cool. And so they should go from hot to cold in a perfect world. So we call this normal zone. Now there are instances where you can go from cold to hot. If you have new magma coming in, that's something called reverse zone. This is normal reverse zone. And this, so within one mineral system, within a solid solution, we can get an idea if something's colder or hotter. If you have two minerals, or not even necessarily two minerals, if you have two phases, you not only know if it's colder or hotter, but you can estimate the absolute temperature. And so this is a classic, uh, a classic two-phase thermometer, the two periods of thermometer, which is in an equilibrium between the final and the periods. So these are temperature functions. And basically, it's essentially the calcium exchange between these two phases because there's a solvent between the calcium that member and the calcium free member. And their compositions will diverge at lower temperatures. And so the calcium content of the two phases can give you an idea of the equilibrium temperature of those two phases, assuming they were in contact with one another at that time. Again, back to a go. We're looking at these longer crystals, which are clusters of crystals. We see we have both of these pyroxenes, orthopyroxene, pyroxene, counterpyroxene. And not only that, we have uh, we have these minerals that are zones. We have different conditions preserved, different temperatures. And you can see that the only zone on the external surface is where they're in contact with the melt. You see a zone here, but you don't see a zone here. And likewise, you see a zone. You see zoning here and, and here along this room, but not here. And that gives you the idea that, that you've got two equilibrium conditions preserved. You've got the first condition, these were already stuck together, and then they came to another condition and they crystallized these rooms. So you preserve equilibrium condition one in the cores, equilibrium two, condition two at, at, the, at the rims, and they were together for both of these, so you've got two different temperatures. I don't have a slide for the pressure, but you can also get pressure from this because those relationships along along this solvus they slide a little bit with, with pressure. And there are some other substitutions, so it's a little bit complicated. But you get the idea that we can get both pressure and temperature from these equilibrium conditions. So here the filled symbols are the cores and the hollow symbols are the rims. So and then the, the blue is the 1843 eruption, the red is so the cores are forming at lower temperature but higher pressure deep in the earth. And then the rims are forming at lower pressure and sometimes higher temperature shock. So you've got magma storage happening here, and then it's moving to shallower levels to form those rims. So we know something about the plumbing beneath the normal volcano from equilibrium viscous, from two periods of equilibrium so it's more and more thermal barometer. Amphibole, this, so this is another type of thermal barometry. Um, amphibole is only stable in the system at higher pressure, so you can see it, it'll start to break down as it comes to the surface. So we see relics of these, so we know the magma is ascending fairly quickly in the system. And we can plot those amphibole pressures next to our piercing pressures. I don't necessarily believe this. It's not, uh, I think it's not very accurate. You see evidence there's a bit of an autocorrelation here. Uh, this is not something I put a lot of faith in, but it's convergent evidence. Although I, I believe these pressures much more than I believe these, but they sh the idea is the effort shows the same thing that's happening. So, okay, so we know what's happening. We know that, that the magma is moving from deep to shallow. But how long does that take? Again, we want to know how long we have to wait. So we've got to go back to time. So, how we, can, how we can approach time scales on these systems when we have no observation, they happened in 1843, nobody knows what happened, is we can look at crystals and we can look at diffusion. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so here's another method, uh, diffusion chronology. And this is how we can approach time scales in these processes that we're talking about. The lava, the magma moving from deep to shallow. We don't know how long that takes. 
And it works like this. Uh, we look at zones and minerals again. We look at zoning. So how does that develop? Well, in this case, uh, young magma chamber, new magma comes in in a discrete event. It forms a finite boundary. Uh, and that crystal is erupted from the volcano. We cut it open and look inside to see to look for this chemical boundary. But this chemical boundary, when, it, when it's young, it looked like this. It was a sharp, discrete chemical boundary. But over time, you'll get substitutions happening. You'll get diffusion along this. So it starts to get blurred, right? So here we have you know, chemical composition one, chemical composition two. If you wait till time two, chemical composition one and chemical composition two become mixed together as atoms substitute for one another. And the rate at which this happens is known for a lot of substances. It's been experimentally determined. And uh, it's also a function of temperature. So remember, we had temperature control. We know the temperature because we have the two periods in thermometer. So then we can start to look at the time scales uh, by looking at mixing along these zones. And this is what our data looks like. This is maybe not the best image, but yeah, again, again. Time zero would be a, a, a perfect step, and then with time, you'll get diffusion of these components. And here we're looking at, I think it's on the next slide, actually. Oh, sorry, this is, uh, this is jumping back a little bit. Oh, you can't see the equation. Oh, there it is. Is that it? Oh, okay, so what we're using, if you want to do it yourself, uh, if you're curious what we're doing, look up fixed second law. This is a, it's on Wikipedia. This is actually a pretty good description of it. But uh, this is how we model mathematically diffusion, if you want to try it yourself. OK, so getting back to our glomerate crisp here, uh, we used our EPMA. We measure a profile here from quarter rim with one micron spacing. And then we plug this into our diffusion model here. <laughs> Although this is, this is a very uh, small interface. So what we're modeling here is the exchange of iron and magnesium across this interface. Right? So these two will substitute for one another in this orthopedic in crystal. I don't know, we put, the, we put the temperature to 1,000 degrees in this case, and then it gave us 10 days. Now this is, unfortunately, that's, that's kind of too small for us to measure, right? Our measurements are right on top of each other in this case. I mean, we can see a little bit, and we can get a best fit, but we're kind of at the limits of what we can do with the EPMA. Uh, so with the EPMA, if this were the real profile, this is what we would measure, because we get some convolution of neighboring points, because of the electrons go all over inside the sample. So there's a little bit of signal convolution. And so most often the time scales that we're getting are maximum estimates. We tend to overestimate the amount of time in the volcanic system just because of our instrumental limitations. Uh, so the limitation, the ultimate limit of the EPMA technique, we're saying it's about the precision of the technique is about one to three days is the smallest time scale that we can measure at these temperatures. That's actually pretty optimistic. It's probably more like two weeks. We also have some, I mean, if you look at some longer time scales here, this is a, a longer gradient. Um, you can see this crystal zone, I don't know if it's, maybe it's better here. It's dark in the middle and then bright here. This would be a longer profile, so if we fit a step function to that, you know, it's more like 113 years. Uh, you know, time one, time two, time three, time four. This is time zero, time one, like that. We get a best fit of about 112 years. Within one crystal, you might have several zones here. You can see this is oscillatory zone. Bright, dark, bright, dark. But if you look, the time scales associated with the core to the rim, the time scales get shorter and shorter as they should. So this 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 zone has been in, in the in the magnetic system for nine years, perhaps. This one, you know, six months, uh, one month, a week. And so the time scales get shorter and shorter as we go to the rim. So that tells us that what we're doing is maybe at least consistent with observation. Uh, olivine, another mineral, we're using a different program here. Again, uh, I can't see, oh here, 283 days. 
So we, we take all these different uh, these different chronometers that we have, every place we did a measurement, and we plot them up. This is the 1963 eruption, 1843. This is log axis time, right? So uh, it gets it gets the time series longer. But you see that most of what we're seeing in 1963 is maybe three, four, five months prior to eruption, right? Almost all the activity is happening. So this is what the run-up must have looked like in 1963. If we had seismometers in 1963, maybe they would have been detecting this for a couple months prior to eruption, similar to what we saw in 2017. And then we don't see any activity recorded in the 1963 for 100 years. So what happened 100 years before 1963? It erupted, so it's maybe that these crystals have been hanging around since this eruption. This eruption, however, had a little bit different run -up. It was it was actually maybe even decades of small small recharge before it finally erupted. So not every eruption is the same, is what we're finding out. But a, a big eruption like 1963, the run-up lasted maybe three months. And again, that's consistent with what we saw. We saw peak seismicity in September and eruption in November. So uh, this is just as, a, as an afterthought. We started looking at these things we can't measure. Remember I said our EPMA is limited to kind of one micron spacing. We can only measure things that are you know at least a week old or something like that. But we were curious about these really small profiles. And they're actually more here because we couldn't measure them. We, they're not plotted here. Uh, we want to look at those to see if we can get an idea of how fast the magma actually comes from deep to shallow. Uh, you know, the, the ascent rate. And to do that, we actually, we, we have a guy from Bali, actually, who, uh, who lives in the shadows of this volcano. He used the focus ion beam technique. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's, uh, you, you can, it's a nanofabrication technique where you can extract small, pieces of a sample or carve carve out different pieces of a sample uh, using an ion beam. So he was able to lift out, he cut this out and, and remove this small sample called a foil, welded it to this little needle and then mounted it so he could look at it on a transmission electron microscope. Here's what it looked like. Uh, and yeah, finally, this is the profile he got. Again, this uh, here on the x-axis, these are microns. So. This whole profile is less than a micron across, but that's okay because he can get, you know, better than 10 nanometer spatial resolution. And if we model this, we get a time scale of 25 hours. So it may be that, uh, well, again, you've got considerable error here. So it could be as little as, what is that, eight hours or as much as, uh, what, 70, sorry, 70, 83 hours. So. <laughs> When the magma is finally coming up, when, when the seismometers detect uh, you, that, that, the, that the seismicity is getting shallower and shallower, you may have, you know, you've got a matter of hours, at most you've got days before this is going to reach the surface. Uh, at least in this case that we've looked at, although this is really preliminary work. It is consistent though uh, with observations from 1963. So in 1963 there were two days of tremor before the big eruption. Before, or sorry, not before the biggest eruption, but before uh, magma reached the surface. And so, yeah, that kind of fits with the time scales that we're getting from observation. Uh, so, I'm going to stop for a second before we, that was, that was it for a uh, Before we go to our next volcano and see if anybody has any questions. How many of you have used an electron microscope? Oh, okay. Yeah, so you've used probably an EDS detector. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Uh, you measured chemistry, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, when I'm using uh, I'm prescribed the morphology of my material mm -hmm. include uh, the element inside because uh, in our laboratory, the sand is created with um, energy dispersive spectroscopy, that was right. explained previously. And because my material is kind of topping material, so it helps it help so much because I can know the distribution of my meta, the top end in the material. So like yeah, like, uh, like these optical fibers that we looked at. Even we have different, uh, we have different topic about our experiment, but we have uh, same instrument to analyze it. Yeah. Uh, so the difference between an EDS and a WDS, it, it works on the same principles. It's it's almost exactly the same thing. I guess the, the advantages to the EDS over the WDS technique are that you get all of the x-rays at once with the EDS. You get a complete analysis. You get this whole spectrum, uh, which is advantageous, especially if you don't know what's in there. And then you can deconvolve the spectrum. In most cases, you can get a reasonably good quantitative determination, at least a semi-quantitative determination. What sets WDS, what sets EPMA apart, of course, are these crystals. And we're using crystal spectrometers to select exactly the wavelength. So instead of getting all these energies at once, we're only getting one energy at a time. So we're measuring one element or one background at a time. It's much slower. Uh, typical analysis takes five to ten minutes, whereas an EDS might take 20 seconds or something. Uh, it's, it's not as sensitive, but uh, again, it's, it's the precision that sets EPMA apart from EDS. But in most cases, EDS is so much easier that 90% <laughs> of the time it's good enough, maybe even 90%. So we can uh, measure the atomic, the percentage of atomic and weight percentage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. It gives you a semi -quantitative, quantitative determination. So in EDS, normally your totals are 100%. You took everything and you normalized to 100%. In EPMA, your totals might be 99% or 101% if you're lucky. If, if it's a poor house, it might be 95% or something, and then you know something's wrong. Uh, but yeah, that, that's, that's in most cases, EDS and WS will give you the same answer. Almost the same. Is anybody from Bali? Is anybody from Bali? You saw some of the eruption activity. What? Did you see some eruption activity or no? Oh, um, actually, the Agu Mountain a little bit far from my place, but the uh, snow, yeah, I can see it. Ah. Ah. different volcano that's uh, much less dangerous because, well, Bali has, what, how many people live there? Five, six, seven million people live in Bali. Mm -hmm. This is on an island where nobody lives. Yeah, Lots of time. Okay. So in this, in this uh, study, we also compared the ancient activity with Bhattatara with the modern activity of Bhattatara, uh, although we're going a little bit further back in time. But it, it's a similar situation where all we have are the rocks to look at. We don't have seismic data, we don't have GPS, all we've got are the rocks, so what can they tell us? Bhattatara is located here, so Timor, uh, this is Flores, uh, Adonara, 
Is that Adonara? Yeah, that's Adonara. This is, uh, I guess Limbata is here. Yeah, right. Oh, no, sorry. That's, and, oh, sorry. This is, yeah, this is Limbata. It doesn't look right there. It looks better here. Uh, and Limbata is host to several volcanoes, actually. Um, and up until recently, three active ones. So they, they actually have festivals. They have the, the three Benum, the Tiga Benum Festival, uh, which was held this year in late August, uh, where people go there and they visit these three active volcanoes. Of course, Batatara stopped erupting uh, really in 2016, but in 2017 it finally, its smoke more or less went out. So maybe they should change the name to the Dua Benum Festival. <laughs> Still only have two active volcanoes left. Uh, Le Levatolo, or Iñapi, it's also called. That's a, that's a very active volcano, and the activity is increasing there. Uh, we roam. They put a new road in here. It used to be difficult. You could only get there by boat. Now you can drive right up to it. Worth the visit if you're in the area. Uh, but Batatara is by itself off on an island. Several hours boat ride away. Uh, this is a classic relationship that we see with an arc. So as we get Remember, there's a subduction zone here, uh, where the, what the, the Indian Ocean and Australia are trying to subduct beneath this trench. And so as you get further away from that trench, the potassium content of magma increases in a cross-arc relationship. It's seen in a lot of different arcs. Batatara is kind of an extreme case where it's ultra potassium, they call it. It's really high potassium. So it's, it's, it's kind of a weird volcano. Uh, here's what it looks like. You can see uh, it's also called Pulau Comba in some cases. The east side of the mountain is missing. There's been a, a major landslide at some time in its history. It's similar to a Stromboli volcano in Italy where half the volcano is kind of missing. This is what it looked like in 1935, 1984, and then in 2014 it looked like this. This is during the eruption cycle. It was erupting about every 20 or 30 minutes uh, for a few years. And uh, this is what it looks like from that, again, that dissected side of the volcano. You have the older, the older sequences that built the island, and then you have the young stuff coming down this escarpment. And uh, there's, if you look at the older sequences, actually, there's a lot of fresh surfaces on those older sequences because the, all the shaking of the volcano has knocked loose quite a few boulders. So you get. Uh, you can actually go there and get some fresh sample now because the the side of the volcano is falling away. And this is the, the beach there. So how did it build? It's actually, I don't have the scale here, but it's it's fairly deep ocean there. I forget the exact ocean depth, but it's, oh, sorry, sorry it's, oh, it's right there. It's two kilometers ocean depth. So this volcano had to build up from two kilometers under the sea it breached the surface, it's what, almost almost a thousand kilometers high. If you look at the old activity where, where the edifice was being built, you see uh, there are different textures. The rocks look different from the time when it's being built compared with the young activity. And there's recorded young activity in the 1800s, there's some sampling uh, in the 1940s, 1980s, and then it, there was an uh, active period again this younger stuff looks a little bit different in terms of the texture and mineralogy. And so that's what we wanted to look at. Like, why, why are the, the lavas that built the volcano look so much different than what's coming out now? What's going on? This is what the old lavas look like. Uh, they're quite striking. Uh, this is lucite, which is an unusual mineral that you don't commonly see. You see these oscillatory zone pyroxenes. Uh, it's, they're really, they're beautiful rocks. Uh, when you show them to people in the microscope, people are they're always amazed because of these, uh, especially because of these zone periods here. They're interesting to look at. When you look at the younger stuff, yeah, not so much. It doesn't have the same mineralogy. It has a lot of biotin, which is a, a mica. Uh, you can see it's more vesicular because it was a more explosive eruption. That already gives you an idea that there are more volatiles in the younger magma um, because you have you have the, again, you have this uh, phlogopite, you have this biotite, which incorporates water into its structure, and then you also have these big holes that are forming when, as gas expands when it erupts. And we see it again here. There, uh, the younger lavas are slightly more silica-rich, not a lot, 
Uh, but that's probably not what's responsible for the preference of flogopite over leucite. So remember the old lavas, we saw a lot of this leucite, and the young lavas, we see flogopite. Turns out that this phase, that this, uh, phase boundary shifts with water content. It'll favor this aqueous phase. So we're saying there's higher water content in the magma, so we're getting more flogopite to take up the potassium instead of the leucite. So we have more water. We look at those pyroxenes. Remember those beautifully zoned pyroxenes? Well, they contain a lot of chromium. And we don't see that in the younger logs. We don't see this high chromium content. The interesting thing about chromium is that it's highly compatible. So that means that uh, in a magmatic system, if you have some chromium around, the minerals that are crystallizing will take it out of the system. They'll scavenge it out quickly. So you only see chromium if you have fresh mafic input, fresh mantle, sorry, fresh magma from the mantle coming in on a regular basis, especially to start to see, you know, one weight percent in these minerals, uh, chromium, that's very high. So this tells us that fresh, a lot of fresh magma is coming in in the older lavas that built the volcano, not so much today. So again, this is our trick. We take the EPMA and we measure these zoning profiles. We see one of these zone uh, pyroxene finicris that are so striking. We go from the rim to the core. So if you want to get an idea of, of the growth direction or time, you have to go this way. So the mineral's growing. You see these little spikes in chromium that are coming in. And then chromium dies off fairly quickly after sun comes in, even before everything else has a chance to equilibrate. So these are these. It's recording these discrete magma recharge events. Fresh magma coming in again, again, here, 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 there. We also see both uh, normal and reversely zoned olivine. Remember, this is olivine going from this went from high temperature to low temperature, low temperature to high temperature. We have both of these in this system. Which makes sense, again, from this perspective, if you have olivine in this reservoir, you've got fresh magma coming in. This reservoir is cooled a bit, so if it's heated, you'll get reversely zoned fenacris, and if it's cool, sorry, the, mag the olivine that's carried by this lava would cool down, it would form normally zoned fenacris, and the olivine that was hanging around this magma chamber was heated, would get reversely zoned. So we would see both normal and reverse zoning coming from the same system. Again, we apply our diffusion chronology tricks. This is a reverse zoned olivine. Uh, and we get, you know, that, that this whole system, if you, if you immersed it at this equilibrium con condition, within 30 days, everything would be totally flat. This would have totally flattened. So we know that this texture is well less than 30 days old, probably just a few days or hours old, that this is happening before the lava erupts. Here's another one. This one's uh, normally zoned. Uh, okay, this is, this is a bit longer. This here we've got, uh, what, two years. Uh, this is in the system. So anywhere from hours to days to a couple of years. And so that kind of brackets, uh, I guess, one gives us kind of a time scale of mixing and activity of the eruption. The other one's giving us the time scale of maybe an eruptive episode, that it might be active for at least a couple of years. And that's kind of what we see. You know, it was active for several years. Uh, which some volcanoes are only active for a few months and some are active for several years and some seem to be active for centuries. Again, uh, younger lavas, higher silica, higher water, and uh, older lavas have more primitive magmas. So what's that tell us about, about volcanoes and what they do? Well, the old lavas, we had a lot of primitive magmas coming in, Less, less volatile, so less explosive eruptions. So what happens to the lavas when they come up? They pile up. So you build, a, you build a tall volcano by having lower volatile content, right? And a lot of magma coming in, a lot of fresh magma. And you can build a big volcano from two kilometers below the ocean, two kilometers below the ocean surface to one kilometer above. So that was what was happening during this time. What's happening now is, is a little bit more destructive. The magma is coming out and it's volatile rich, it's exploding. It's not building a big volcano anymore. In fact, it's, it's kind of destroying the volcano that's there. And so this is something we see. Uh, and so it's good to know when you're dealing with a volcano whether you're in this phase or that phase, because this phase is more explosive and, and builds more ash and is potentially more destructive, whereas this, you know, 
It's actually constructive. You get you get more land. Uh, again, just more evidence uh, of, of high volatile content if you compare uh, sulfur content of appetite. Here's some maps. You see the uh, common volatile phases in appetite. Uh, fluorine is ubiquitous. Fluorine is a little bit zoned, but then you see this concentric zoning in sulfur, which is a little bit weird. Do we have any crystallographers here? Does anybody study crystals? I don't. Oh, okay. But this is neat from a crystallographic perspective because uh, the appetite structure, it's, 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 like, it's like a tube. It's like a drinking straw, the structure of this. It's a, it's a ring forming a tube. And the anions, sorry, are these like uh, water or OH, uh, fluorine, chlorine, sulfur, they tend to go in this channel site right up the middle. And so it's like a straw. They can diffuse in and out very quickly. And so when we look at things like this, okay, chlorine is diffusing, this, this is the C-axis here, so it's a drinking straw. Chlorine is going in and out, it's diffusing that way. But sulfur is not. And actually, well, I guess, I guess it's actually the crystals in there at sort of an angle. But you can see that, that sulfur is not, it's not diffusing easily. So it tells us that sulfur is probably not in that anion site. It must be uh, substituting into substitute for phosphorus in, uh, in one of these tetrahedral sites here. Because these sites are, are not linked along this, this drinking straw, right? They're more like what the, what the drinking straw is made of. They're the structure of the drinking straw, I guess. Again, some more maps. You see this, this sulfur zoning. And so we looked at a couple of substitution mechanisms. So you could have, if sulfur is going to these tetrahedral sites, substituting for phosphorus, you can have coupled substitutions with silicon to get a charge balance, okay? or you can have coupled substitutions with sodium to achieve charge balance. And if you sum if you sum up these two couple potential coupled substitutions, looking at these minor elements, sodium and silicon, you actually account for most of the sulfur that's in these appetites. And so that's a one-to-one -one line. So this would be 100%. If 100% of the sulfur were in these tetrahedral sites, you'd be along this one-to-one -one line. If you sum these two substitutions, we're a little bit off, but we see that, that probably this is where the sulfur is residing in, in the appetite, which makes it a great recorder of sulfur content of the magma through time, right? These sulfur-rich episodes are happening during the magmatic history in the same way these magmatic pulses are happening, and it's being recorded, and it's not diffusing in and out like chlorine and fluorine or water or these things that we... Uh, these more common volatiles that we measure. So, so these appetites are, are nice recorders of the volatile content. And do we believe it? Yeah, we probably believe there's a lot of sulfur in the system because we also have, I don't know if you can see this, but we have some sulfide minerals. Well, it's really dark, but you have these occurring as inclusions in other minerals in the system. So we've got sulfide saturation occurring. So it's a high sulfur system, it's a volatile rich system. Uh, at least now compared to what it was. So, I'm going to end there, uh, but not quite there. I got a couple of eruption pictures. Uh, this is, a, yeah, this is us on the boat coming back, actually, from about to turn. Thank you.
well, each, each mountain, yeah, to characterize each mountain, that's the goal. Now, uh, the reason why we're doing this, the reason why we're looking at the rocks actually is because we're desperate. Because uh, humans have only been looking at volcanoes in a scientific way for some decades. Uh, but volcanoes only erupt every, every hundred or thousand years. So we don't have the geophysical records that we would like from the previous eruptions. So we're forced to look at the rocks and try to interpret what happened from the rocks. Now, there is a feedback loop that's going on now, and that's what we're seeing today, is that we can look at the geophysics from an eruption, a big eruption, even like Pinatubo in 1991 or one of these, where we have, we have very good records or some of the uh, volcanoes in Japan that are very well monitored, and we know exactly what magma came from where and when, and then we can look at the eruption products and see if we see what we think, what, what actually happened. We, I guess we have a known, we have some ground truth to what we're doing now. So then we can better go back and look at prehistoric eruptions to see what happened with the volcano. Because a lot of the most, like, the most dangerous volcanoes, particularly in Indonesia, haven't erupted on human timescales. You know, something like, uh, especially like you say, Sumatra, these huge caldera eruptions like Tobo or Renau, or these, these, uh, these super colossal VI-10 type eruptions. We don't have those, luckily, we don't have those uh, in, in the historical records. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But maybe we can look at some smaller eruptions and scale up, I guess. Uh, you know, and, and then we can look at the eruption products of those super eruptions and try to, to know uh, how much warning we would have had, what would have been happening in that area prior to that big eruption, if we could have predicted it. And if we can predict it, can we predict it a year in advance, a month in advance, 10 years in advance? We don't know. Uh, but there are a lot of big volcanoes that seem ready to, to erupt, but is it going to happen next year? Is it going to happen 100,000 years from now? That's uh, what we're trying to know. So, in general, when uh, the first, I mean, the first time the volcano falls, like the magma from the side, uh, So they do actually is the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like a, a, a caldera type eruption uh, may may not have a large surface expression, other than sort of a broad geographic rise from the hot magma underneath. But the, it may never build a, a volcanic edifice. It may just explode. Okay. So it's not to do you in every case. <laughs> But yeah, in the cases we looked at, we're both, both of these are large volcanic mountains, uh, with, and the history changes through time, and, and, uh, and generally, yeah, if something's building itself up, it's not exploding, and then at some point, it may turn into something that explodes, or maybe not. That's, yeah, what and we... And the last thing is when you say that, so in the youngs, uh, But one of the ways to do that is through fractional crystallization. So most of the crystals that will form from a magma are lower in silica than the magma itself. So if you produce a whole bunch of these crystals, uh, actually mainly olivine, which you don't see here, maybe that's one, uh, and these fall out, the composition of the remaining liquid will move towards higher silica. And also higher volatile content, because these minerals, most of these don't contain volatile things either. So as you as you drop minerals out, you will passively concentrate silica and water. So it could be that we're starting with the same magma, actually, between yeah. that, that... Because it's the same temperature, temperature Initially. Water. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Initially, these... I mean, they're both ultra-potassic. They both have high potassium, so probably they formed under similar conditions in the Earth's mantle, but on way to the surface, uh, 
This one, I guess this one spent more time on its way to the surface, would be one way to increase volatiles and silica content. What else is going on? We don't know. It could be, you know, various. It could be interaction with seawater. There could be all kinds of things that we, that we don't know. We know it's changed. But uh, one way would be just to remove those crystals that you see there. You could eventually get to this, uh, depending on the plumbing system. So whether you have an open vent to the surface where a lot of a lot of fresh magma is coming up, or whether it's a closed system with isolated batches of magma that are occasionally coming up, and they're spending more time. And we see that also here. Yeah. So we can we uh, can we adjust adjust uh, I mean the yield and the ore to the yield and the So they're both, they're both basalt. Oh. The young is between 50 and 55 weight percent SiO2. And the old, I think, gets down to maybe 48 or 47 weight percent SiO2. So below 50. Yeah, it's, you know, it's only maybe 3, 4, maximum 5% weight percent difference SL2, but that's enough to, yeah, to behave very differently. Now, as, as we know, the, the silica content of a lava determines it its viscosity. So silica in a melt forms polymer chains, and so the more silica you have in a magma, the more viscous it is, and the more viscous it becomes, the more explosive the eruption can be. So that's what we're seeing in Sumatra, we're seeing these really high silica rhyolites, 75 weight percent silica, 78 weight percent silica, and they're, they're erupting very violently because of the high viscosity of the magma. It can't, it, can't, it can't efficiently form bubbles, the bubbles can't get out, and so the whole thing just rips itself apart all at once. Um, so yeah, the increase in silica is definitely an increase in explosivity in almost every case. field in Indonesia of course you know that actually when when this unrest when this unrest if we go back so I'm gonna go back quite a ways for this I think it's one of the first slides. Oh. There it is. Okay so this is from a paper uh Siabana. I've not met but uh Oh. Okay, uh, so this, when this unrest first started, it wasn't until October. This is a single seismometer, actually, and more seismometers were not installed until about here, sometime in October. And so with the single seismometer, you just get an idea that things are shaking, but you don't know how deep that seismicity is coming from. And it's hard to get a sense of, of what's happening with a single seismometer. And so, I mean, I think the world was really amazed that there's this, this big, dangerous volcano next to five million people with only one seismometer. But in Indonesia, there's so many, there's so many volcanoes that it's, it's that one, I mean, yeah, you have one seismometer there, and you know if it's going to erupt, then you go put some more seismometers in. And so it's only from, from about here onward that we have really good signal that we can start to see magma moving like that. So uh, that's definitely a field where I think you'll see, I guess, a lot of people getting into in Indonesia is volcano monitoring because there are so many volcanoes to monitor. So, uh, yeah, some of you guys coming out of school, you might get into uh, ground deformation, GPS, and uh, seismic monitoring to triangulate and to see what's happening beneath the volcano, volcanic system because there are plenty of volcanic systems. Uh, as opposed to Japan, where there are a lot of geologists, but fewer volcanoes, so every volcano has maybe 20 or 30 seismometers, <laughs> maybe 20 or 30 physicists working on it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. 
di satu sisi itu bencana buat kita, di sisi lain sebenarnya itu ilmu buat kita. To, to know much about what is inside of our body. Jadi di dalam bumi kita itu ada apa saja. Kemudian bagaimana prosesnya. Ini adalah sebenarnya kita itu bersyukur banget sudah punya banyak. Kita punya banyak bencana, kita punya Yeah. 